Matt, hurt me. Jackson, Blood on the Dance Floor, the best dance album in history, Blood on the Dance Floor, 13 tracks, 76 minutes of music, 8 historical remixes, and 5 brand new songs, see the greatest artists of all time in a town near you, Blood on the Dance Floor, the album, now. Ask a Michael Jackson fan what their favorite Michael Jackson album is, and 9 times out of 10, they won't say it's this one. Or this one? And the amount of y'all that sleep on this one right here? Unreal. It's honestly unbelievable how underrated and underappreciated Michael Jackson's later work is, but that's a conversation that y'all aren't ready to have. I bet you're wondering what my favorite Michael Jackson album is, though. This one, and what about it? Tell me, what about it? <laughs> Blood on the Dance Floor has always kind of stuck out in Michael Jackson's discography to me. Just the simple fact that it came out only two years after his last album release, History, in 1995, is enough to make any MJ fan say, Wait a minute! Because we all know, typically MJ album cycles were never that short. Michael always took his sweet time crafting his albums, you know, the perfectionist in him and all that darling. Unlike some of your faves who crank out album releases and singles every year and still fail to chart. How sad. So tell me, how does the best-selling remix album of all time, wait, let me say that again. <clears throat> how does the best-selling remix album of all time fail to be highly regarded by fans, the general public, and overall Michael Jackson's most, for lack of better terms, forgettable album? A lot of people think Michael lost his touch after Dangerous, or well, a lot of people think he lost his touch after he stopped working with Quincy Jones, but that's tea for another day. In all honesty, I just think that this was a record for his label and not necessarily something he wanted to release, as Blood on the Dance Floor was only meant to be an EP or a maxi single. And to my knowledge, Mr. Michael... I believe in... Perfection. Jackson didn't really care for remixes, as he didn't like other producers tampering with his work. So how exactly could something like this come to fruition to begin with? And after the release of History Past, Present, and Future Book 1, was there ever going to be a Book 2, rather than this album having history in the mix? There's definitely a bit to unpack here, darling. So grab a snack and have your tea on standby, because we're going to be discussing the ins and outs of Blood on the Dance Floor like never before, and we are going to be spilling, hunty. Don't let no one get you down. Keep moving on higher ground. Of course, prior to the release of Blood on the Dance Floor, there is what I'd like to personally call the magnum opus of Michael Jackson's career, his 1995 album, History, Past, Present, and Future, Book One. Between this album and his last album, Dangerous, MJ went through hell, and that's putting it lightly, for being crucified in the tabloid press headlines, and today, the London Sun newspaper has literally turned this into a game with a hotline for reported Michael sightings, complete with a $15,000 reward. So you see Michael Jackson as well, have you? Right, and where was he? At Tower Bridge, right. Oh, dangling down from Tower Bridge. To being accused of acts so vile, Michael verbatim has said he would rather slit his wrist than commit. Before I would hurt a child, I would slit my wrist. I would never hurt a child. To even canceling the latter half of his Dangerous World tour to go into rehab for drug treatment. As you may already know, after my tour ended, I remain out of the country undergoing treatment for a dependency on pain medication. This medication was initially prescribed to see the excruciating pain that I was suffering after recent reconstructive surgery on my scalp. There have been many disgusting statements made recently concerning allegations of improper conduct on my part. These statements about me are totally false, 
as I have maintained from the very beginning, I am hoping for a speedy end to this horrifying, horrifying experience to which I have been subjected. But let me be clear that according to Frank Cassio in his book, My Friend Michael, he claims, and I quote, in later years, Michael would explain to me that the cancellation of the tour had nothing to do with drug addiction. It was because his next tour date was in Puerto Rico on American soil. And if he had entered the United States at this time, there was a very real chance that he would have been arrested on the allegations of child molestation. To avoid his arrest, his team of handlers had to come up with a way to get him out of the rest of the tour. The only way to guarantee that that part of the tour that was canceled would be covered by insurance would be if Michael opted out because of a medical problem. So he told the world that he had a problem with prescription medicine. The world was so unkind and uncaring to him during this time in his life. And it is because of these accusations, falsehoods, and let's just cut the bullshit straight up lies that interest in Michael specifically in the United States declined. I would also like to add that as someone who is from the United States, people barely talk about Michael's later work. They barely even talk about Dangerous. Like, Growing up, it was always the Quincy trilogy, Off the Wall, Thriller, and Bad, when it's like those albums were only the beginning of MJ's maturing sound and lyricism. And I feel like what a lot of people don't understand is that in some ways, although MJ loved Quincy and admired him dearly as a producer and mentor, he held MJ back. And there were a lot of things that MJ wanted to do musically that he couldn't do under the direction of Quincy, which I'm sure was why, or well, part of the reason why, the two of them stopped working together, among other things. But that's why I tend to make videos focusing on his later work because people really sleep on it, myself included. Justice for Dangerous History, Blood on the Dance Floor, and Invincible Bitch. Now let me stop ranting. This was the comeback album. Despite everything MJ went through those past few years, Michael Jackson still had the juice, could still chart on Billboard, and could still sell out tours. This album had so many themes and messages that MJ simply hadn't touched on in his prior albums. I'd honestly love to do a deep dive on this one, so let me know if you'd want that. With songs like DS, where he shits all over the artist previously known as the Santa Barbara County District Attorney Tom Schneddon, I mean Dom Sheldon, for a glorious 4 minutes and 49 seconds. Did y'all know he died in like 2014? Girl, I hope God has a better heart than I do because I'm just saying, homeboy might want to dress light where I'ma send him. Or songs like This Time Around where he opens up about the struggles of being famous and achieving superstardom. With this song, MJ told you he ain't taking no shit and that no false accusations will take him down because he's Michael motherfucking Jackson and the truth prevails bitch, or even money, a song you can play when you're going through difficult financial times. I wish I was joking. Whoever runs the Michael Jackson Twitter account actually tweeted this, discussing how the people in charge of his estate don't even know his discography, and they're the true ones infected with the same disease of lust, gluttony, and greed. But let's not even go there. And of course, songs like Childhood, where MJ pours his heart into the saddest song in his discography about how he didn't get the chance to enjoy the simplicities of youth. To quote his speech at the 1993 Grammys, My childhood was completely taken away from me. There was no Christmas. There was no birthdays. It was not a normal childhood. No normal pleasures of childhood. Those were exchanged for hard work, struggle, and pain and eventual material and professional success. But as an awful price, I cannot recreate that part of my life, nor would I change any part of my life. I just gotta tell y'all, this song came out of my car one day and child, Jesus had to take that wheel because my ass was about to start bawling. The amount of unwarranted disrespect Michael Jackson received and continues to receive is just baffling and truly sickening. This man sacrificed everything to bring peace, love, and joy to everyone around the world and y'all just be out here on that fucking Bluebird app saying he's washed up, calling every music artist under the sun the king of pop, <sighs> and saying no one cares about him anymore. Man, fix it, Jesus, before I do.
Anyway, I say all this to say that this album was a masterpiece. Sony even spent about $30 million on promotion alone. I mean, to get the gem that was the history teaser and the statues, I think it was worth it. Honestly, such an iconic rollout. End of discussion. And to go from that to whatever the hell they're doing with Thriller 40, whoo child, let me stop talking my shit, let me stop talking my shit! The album debuted at number one on the Billboard 200 and Top R&B and Hip Hop Albums charts, sold 391,000 copies in its first week, and won a Grammy for the best short form music video for Scream. Not to mention, I believe at one point this was the best selling double album of all time. I'm unsure if it still is though, but despite all those accomplishments, by its second week of the album being out, it was down 33% in sales, and by its third week, 46%. I feel like this only represents the United States though, honestly, because in other other countries, the album was a massive success, and the history tour beginning in September of 1996 and ending in October of 1997 grossed over $165 million and is one of the top five highest grossing tours of the 1990s and the highest grossing tour by a solo artist in the 1990s. And that's what? My baby, let's go! Despite the album's success in other countries, it was only important to Sony that it did well in the United States. Honestly, I'll never understand that to a certain degree why the US is important because sure, most artists can peak on the US billboard, but not every artist can peak worldwide, and reaching worldwide status is way more impressive in my book. Anyway, while MJ was on the second leg of the history tour, promotion started for Blood on the Dance Floor. Blood on my side. Blood on the Dance Floor was pretty much entirely Sony's idea. Y'all really think Michael? I believe in perfect execution. Jackson? would willingly release a remix album? I mean, MJ was about to start his second leg of the history tour in the summer of 1997, and Sony wanted him to have something to market for the European section of the tour because by the time it would start, history would be two years old, and the biggest tracks of the album, the five singles, Scream, You Are Not Alone, They Don't Really Care About Us, Earth Song, and Stranger in Moscow, would have already been released, and Sony didn't believe any of the remaining tracks on the album, although Fire, would be powerful enough to make the album chart again. And yo, honestly, tabloid junkie, money, this time around, and too bad, would like to have a talk, sweetie. Because I think any one of those had charting power, this time around especially. I mean, it has Biggie in it for Pete's sake. We stand TTA on this channel, thank you. But perhaps the gag with all of those songs is that they were too political, anecdotal, and didn't really leave a nice flavor in people's mouths as far as Sony was concerned. Because the record companies will be damned if they allow an artist to release music talking about things that really matter. Anyway, from a marketing stance, I guess it would have been foolish not to have anything to sell to MJ's demanding audiences. Sony figured it would be impossible for MJ to come up with 10 new songs in the time they had allotted, which is why a lot of Blood on the Dance Floor's tracks are taken straight from the History and Dangerous album sessions. To quote Joseph Vogel's book, Man in the Music, The Creative Life and Work of Michael Jackson, Michael fully anticipated one day releasing a History, Past, Present, and Future book too which would have been another double disc record including more hits and more new songs. But given that the artist was in the middle of a world tour, he knew he wouldn't have the time to come up with a whole new album that was up to his standards. So Michael suggested an EP or a mini album with about five to six new songs and y'all can see where this is going. Sony essentially said, fuck no, as that couldn't be branded as a new album and it definitely couldn't be sold at the same price as an album. And we all know Sony is about that shmoney, honey. Enough to release an album with fake Michael Jackson vocals after his passing and sell it to his fans for over a decade until the tracks were removed from streaming services. You know, 12 years later. Gone, but never forgotten, you trick ass bitches. I heard that Michael didn't even want to release a two disc album because that added to the price and Michael wanted to keep his music affordable for his fans, but Sony wanted to do one disc of greatest hits and another of all new songs and so history was born. Sony really pushed to be able to add remixes to the BOTDF album in addition to the tracks MJ would provide, which during this time in its production potentially included songs like On the Line and In the Back, which both wound up on the Ultimate Collection in 2004 so everyone could 
to be happy, and this would still count as one of six albums per Michael's 1991 contract with Sony. So like clockwork, Stranger in Moscow would be the final single from the History album in January 1997, and in March of 1997, Blood on the Dance Floor, the single, would come out in which Michael put that whole Jax Ussi in. And I want to say I regret saying that, but I don't. The Jax Ussi? was in full throttle that day. But before I talk about that, let's take a segue and talk about Michael Jackson's ghosts. Or should I say, The Adam Family Project. It's just you. Michael had the idea for a horror-themed music video, or more commonly known as the short film in the MJ world, sometime in late 1992, early 1993, after the Japanese leg of the Dangerous Tour ended. He had reached out to one of the greats when it came to horror, Stephen King, to write a screenplay while on set working on his film, The Stand. Him and Michael came up with the scenario over the phone, where the inhabitants of a small village decide to confront a man who lives alone in a strange house and by his own rules. The villagers believe he doesn't belong in their town and that he's a bad influence on their children. King saw this as an example of generational divides so indicative of the rock industry. Stephen King had recommended MJ hire Mick Garris to direct the film, who actually appeared as a zombie extra in Michael's thriller short film in 1983. The two of them came up with the working title for the project, Is This Scary? Is This Scary was part of the promotional campaign for a film called Adam's Family Values, a sequel to the 1991 film The Adam's Family. MJ was even supposed to feature a song in the film called Adam's Groove slash Family Thing. <laughs> The song is mostly rumored to have been removed due to the allegations against him when, in reality, it was because of contractual differences with Paramount Pictures. All of the child actors from the feature film were set to be in Is This Scary. A few weeks before Michael resumed the Dangerous tour in Asia, they had all spent about two weeks filming outdoor scenes and scenes with the Adam family children. The music scenes couldn't be filmed because MJ and Teddy Riley hadn't finished the song yet at this point. Due to the allegations against Michael Jackson in 1993, Paramount broke their contract, and Michael and Mick Garris were left with nothing but their drafts. I believe Michael was on set when he found out about the allegations against him. In a video by Shana Mangatal, who was an extra in the short film and wrote a book called Michael and Me, The Untold Story of Michael Jackson's Secret Romance, which I'm not going to um, <clears throat> speak on, you can see his anger come out through his acting. She says in August of 1993, she was in the middle of filming. Just before they filmed, Michael learned of allegations against him. Michael was sad, devastated, and angry. In a strange twist of fate, in this scene, Shauna and a few other actors had to stand on the other side of the camera and yell names at him, like weirdo and freak, and say you're scaring our children. Michael could no longer hold his emotions in, and he let out all of his anger out in this scene. You scared our kids, you're weird, you're a freak. You don't want to to any of you. Yeah. Know what you can do for me? Kiss right here. Kiss right here. You're a swine. You're a goddamn pig. Go to hell. Every last one of you, pig. Is this scary? Ah! Ah! The lines were not in the script. This is one of the last scenes he filmed before he became so sick and distraught that he couldn't continue. Ironically, there was a scene in Adam's Family Values where MJ was referenced in the film via a poster in the Harmony Hut advertising his 1992 single, Heal the World, which horrifies Joel. I just wanted to read. Not on my time, Four Eyes. <laughs> This was filmed prior to the allegations, I believe, but still, poor taste, but kind of funny he's randomly afraid of MJ. Imagine being afraid of Michael Jackson? Like, how are people genuinely afraid of this man? This man that stopped a concert to have security pick up a bug on stage. This man that enjoys food fights, climbing trees, water balloon fights, and fishing. N n n n not, not that kind of fishing. Whoa. Whoa. This is 
There are clips of Is This Scary here on YouTube, and I'll have them linked in the description for you guys. As always, sharing is caring, darling. We don't gatekeep on this channel. This version seems more raw, and I guess adult, than what we would later receive in Ghosts. Of course, the differences are subtle, but I felt like Ghosts was more family-oriented, whereas to me, it seems like there was definitely a lot more improv in Is This Scary, but of course, the film wasn't completed, so that could be why. Ghosts also had darker undertones, as a lot of the film represented the media and public's portrayal of Michael after the allegations against him in 1993. I think the mayor low-key could represent Tom Schneiden. Plus, one of the keywords mentioned throughout the film is MJ constantly being called a freak, and everyone thought that of him back then, and some, unfortunately, continue to think that way of him now. Ghosts, in general, has given me a greater appreciation for MJ's acting skills, because I'm gonna be real with y'all. Prior to seeing Is This Scary and taking the time to revisit ghosts. I didn't think MJ was that strong of an actor. I mean, the most memorable thing I remember about Captain EO is... Hooter! Hooter! Hooter, stay in the sand! It's right behind you, Hooter! Hooter. <laughs> Hooter. Hooter, don't be silly. Hooter, hurry up! 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 And... I don't think his acting was the greatest in his film Moonwalker or even The Wiz. Why are you pulling me? I'm right. But I definitely think he had potential to do films like he had wanted as an actor and of course as a director. I feel like MJ would have created such amazing movies and shows targeted towards children and families. A show kind of like Andre 3000's Cartoon Network show Class of 3000, where the children love and enjoy music while also learning life lessons along the way. I know that getting into film was the plan after completing the This Is It tour. I just wish we had gotten to see that come true. One thing I really admire about his acting skills, specifically in ghosts is his ability to convey emotion through his facial expressions. Like you can really see it in his eyes, which seems like it would be simple and a given thing, but there are actors out there who are just reading lines off of a page, and then there are actors who are embodying the character, and MJ really did that with this role. It could be due to the similarities, again, between him and the characters he played, though, but let me get a little into the film we now know and love. Michael Jackson's Ghosts. In 1995, MJ was of course recording and promoting his album History, but it was also during this time that he would get back in touch with Mick Garris to reignite the Is This Scary project. This time, he wanted it to be more personal, and he wanted to be more in control. Using it as an outlet for settling scores with part of a public opinion and with a media that had been harassing him for years. He planned on using Too Bad from the History album as the lyrics aligned with the theme, and Ghosts, which was recorded with Teddy Riley. And soon, became the new title for Is This Scary. Mick Garris was busy during this time filming the Shining miniseries, and so he suggested MJ get Stan Winston to direct. So this is why we needed you here. This is what this is all about. You start thinking. Oh, Stan Lee. Don't start with me, Michael. I am your elder, okay? Show a little respect. You see these gray hairs here? <laughs> And I don't know why, but I die laughing every time I see that. MJ, sir, show some decorum. Stan was an old friend of MJ's. They had known each other since MJ was 16. He was responsible for the makeup and effects on the set of The Wiz in late 1977. I've known Stan Winston since I was 16 years old. He did all of the effects for a film I did called The Wiz, where I played the scarecrow. In case you didn't know, <laughs> I'm the director. We're in trouble. <laughs> So the two of them got to work in early 1996. The mayor was no longer going to be played by Ken Jenkins. Bob Kelso, is... is that you? And MJ decided to play him. MJ played five characters in the short film. The Maestro, Mayor, Mayor Ghoul, Super Ghoul, and Skeleton. Who is out here doing it like Michael Jackson these days? Who, I ask you? 
This man was one of the hardest working men in show business, period. Anyway, one of the most notable changes in Stan Winston's version is the ending. According to the book Michael Jackson, All the Songs, The Story Behind Every Track, in Mick Garris's version, when faced with the rage of the villagers hunting him down, the maestro disintegrates by hitting the ground with his head and fists until he disappears in a cloud of dust. The village children gather all the particles scattered on the ground and put their friend's body back together again. The hero is reborn from his ashes before the stunned eyes of the mayor, played by Ken Jenkins. In Stan Winston's version, the scene is replaced by a sleight of hand. Once Michael is reduced to ashes, the villagers go to leave, but when they open the door, the mayor comes face to face with a monstrous version of the maestro, who scares him into running away. The owner of the manor reappears, and the villagers realize that his presence is not a threat to their town. This happy ending gives ghosts a humorous bent, significantly undercutting Michael's initial intention of creating a dark piece. Also in early 1997, the film was changed again to feature the song Is It Scary, in part with Too Bad. The film premiered at the 50th annual Keynes Film Festival. The budget was $17 million, none of which MJ got back due to it only being shown at free events. Sony had released the film on VHS, Laserdisc, and video CD format in Europe and Asia. And before y'all try to come for me, yes, I know what a Laserdisc is and a VHS. I'm young, but I ain't that young. And as soon as I get up from this chair, my bones gonna sound like Rice Krispies. Snap, crackle, pop, bitch. You shall. Anyways, the proceeds off of those releases were nothing compared to the Thriller video, which was co-financed by MTV and Showtime, and benefited from a global release to the home video market. Of course, in the early 2000s, Michael started working on a DVD release, but the strained relationship with Sony during that time... pretty much kissed that goodbye. I've, I've generated several billion dollars for Sony. Several billion. And, um... They, they really thought that my mind is always on music and dancing and, and, I, and it usually is, but they never thought that this performer myself would outthink them. And it's 2022. Do we still not have a DVD version of Ghosts yet? Or did that come out? Man, the Michael Jackson estate really gives us the bare minimum, huh? And I feel like saying that is being too nice. I mean, I guess there's hope for when Prince Michael Jackson takes it over when he's 40, right? I feel like Ghosts was MJ's one huge passion project, and it shows, and I'm glad that he had the chance to do at least one major short film where he was primarily in charge. Again, though, I wish we had gotten him doing more major film roles. Of course, years later, he would have small cameos and things here and there, like Men in Black 2 as Agent M in 2002, and Agent MJ and Miss Castaway in The Island Girls in 2004. If you do not destroy the Ark, then mankind will pay dearly for the consequences. Can you teach me how to moonwalk? Phew, a whole mess. And a hot one at that. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't take it. Now, let's talk about Blood on the Dance Floor. After weeks of negotiations, the concept for the Blood on the Dance Floor album was born. It was pretty much a hybrid of a traditional album and a compilation album, featuring five new songs and eight remixes for a total of 13 tracks. There were originally 10 to 12 new songs considered, but MJ settled on five. Production started in January of 1997, and the first song Michael chose was a song that was actually meant for the Dangerous album, the title track, Blood on the Dance Floor. The track is just an appetizer for what I feel is the darkest album in Michael's discography. It's the story of a woman named Susie, portrayed by Sybil Jour in the short film, who seduces Michael for one night, just to enjoy that simple dance of course, and Michael fell into it because she seemed sincere, like it was love and true romance. Turns out she just wanted to stab Michael in the back and he just couldn't take it. Just couldn't break it, you know? Feel free to unsubscribe. Anyway, how the hell did Michael always get involved with these hoes? Billie Jean? Diana? Susie? Even poor Annie! To this day, I still don't know if she's okay. I guess that's what he gets for going fishing, though. Good fish! 
However, there are theories about this song being about more than just that simple dance. Let me get my icy hot real quick, as the amount of reaching I'm about to do by telling you this theory is surely going to cause me to pull a back muscle. People have theorized that the song is about AIDS. They've said Susie represents AIDS and that guys are taking their chances, fooling around, and then later regret it because Susie slash AIDS has their number. Child, people even out here just comparing the song to other consequences of sex in general, saying the song is about promiscuity and how relationships now are different from how they were back in the day. Now it's just about sleeping with as many people as possible with no relationship involved. And everyone thinks they're safe and they're going to be okay until something happens like an STD or a pregnancy or a woman who won't leave you alone. Let me say this for the girls, you know, in the balcony. The girls in the balcony, I love you, you're wonderful. Blood is on the dance floor. Blood is on the knife. My homie Michael got stabbed. It's honestly ludicrous to even give these theories the time of day. I'm pretty sure Michael denied the song being about AIDS anyway. I know over the years there have always been a lot of innuendos in Michael's songs, particularly Billie Jean when they danced on the floor in the round. Just say so you got some player, ain't no shame. Blood on the Dance Floor was one of about 10 tracks Teddy Riley had written for Michael for the Dangerous album. And y'all know after the Michael album debacle... I say to the doubters, um, along with my friends who also worked with Michael over 20 years, over mm -hmm. 25 years, mm -hmm. this is Michael's voice. Mm -hmm. I don't really fuck with Teddy Riley to say the least, but of course he did recently admit to the Casio tracks being fake in an interview with DJ Vlad, link for that in the description, after years of siding with the Casios saying they weren't. And as I said earlier in the video, uh, something something, never forgotten, you trick ass bitch. However, you know, the man is a damn genius when it comes to music. And I must say that the story behind this song is actually kind of unique. To again quote Michael Jackson all the songs, the story behind every track, Teddy Riley worked all night and even turned down an invitation to a party, whereas he later found out someone had been killed on the dance floor. Shocked by the news, he continued to work, ending up with a rhythm that was vigorous, dark, and driven by a funky energy only Riley could have mastered. When Michael heard Riley's song ideas, he chose the one that had been written on that fateful night. But to make it even more interesting, I have to quote Joseph Bogle, Book. Jackson had no idea about the events surrounding the song. He knew nothing about it, Riley said. I never told him anything about it. Yet, a couple of weeks later, Riley said he was shocked to learn Jackson's proposed title for the track, Blood on the Dance Floor. Riley got goosebumps. It was like he prophesied that record. He felt its mood. The day I did Blood on the Dance Floor, Damian Hall from Guy, his bodyguard got killed the same day. And when I took it to Michael Jackson, he called it Blood on the Dance Floor. Wow. Wow. I never called it a name. Right, I only right, had right. tracks. He called it wow. Blood on the Dance Floor. Wow. That's See. nuts though. Man, Michael Jackson continues to amaze me. This is why these lessers of today could never. I'm telling ya. One thing you may notice about Blood on the Dance Floor is its similarity to the song Remember the Time. To be honest, I noticed this fairly recently. For that song and a lot of other songs on the Dangerous album, the snares were compressed to make them pop. Another thing you may notice is this bass line. Sounds a lot like a different song you may or may not know called Last Night a DJ Saved My Life by the 1980s group In Deep. Caught in 4K, Teddy. Also, shout out to the lovely Damien Shields for that little factoid. Ultimately, the demo that was worked on with Teddy didn't make it to the Dangerous album, and the song was shelved until early 1997, when MJ, Brad, Buxer and Mick Gazowski started tinkering with it again, adding different instrumentals to Teddy's original tape. Seems like Teddy was a little butthurt that he wasn't the one to complete it. According to Michael Jackson, all the songs, the story behind every track, Teddy Riley couldn't hide his disappointment, but I kind of feel like my work on Blood on the Dance Floor was kind of dated. That's not what I sound like today, but I thank him for giving me the opportunity once again. But what he needs to do is, you know, come back and get some of this heavy R&B and this new funk. If your feelings were hurt, just say that, Theodore. Anyway, now let's discuss the short film. Someone on Twitter said it looked like a red orgy, and I mean, 
are they wrong? As I briefly touched on in my Invincible video, Sony had not prioritized Michael during this time, and pretty much allotted a small budget for the video. They didn't want to take a larger commercial risk like they did with the promotion of history, but they had no problem with commercial speech, am I right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Michael reached out to Vincent Patterson to help make his vision come to life. The two of them worked together on Michael's 1993 Super Bowl halftime show performance. Patterson wanted to make Michael seem more masculine and macho. And girl, the fit in this video, whew, let me have my moment. <laughs> the leather pants, the silk shirt, the French braid, the chain bracelets, and you know when Michael Joe had on that red, he was causing trouble. So the idea was Michael would walk into a club packed with a lot of different characters, each with their own unique story to tell. Susie, portrayed by Sybil Azure, played the mistress that would seduce Michael. Of her time on set, per MJVibe.com, she says, We rehearsed for like five days and filmed for two or three days, and because we were doing salsa and he didn't know anything about salsa, he was really open to learning and very eager and excited. He was so excited about it. I remember he told me at the end of shooting, he said, this is going to be legendary. It was fun to see how passionate he was about his work. There was actually meant to be an entirely different version of the music video out, shot on 8mm film. It was grainy, overexposed, and just overall felt a lot more dirty and sexy. It really portrayed that dark, ambient feel the song gave. But of course, Sony said fuck no, because they thought Michael's videos were meant to have a more clean aesthetic. Man, between Sony and the MJ estate, I truly don't know who I despise more. Okay, right now, the estate is winning. This song is 100% one of my favorite Michael Jackson songs of all time, extremely underrated, and definitely deserves its flowers. Y'all know that meme of MJ floating around from the 30th anniversary special of him saying, I love this song? That's me with BOTDF. Absolutely no BOTDF slander on this channel. Even the Refugee Camp remix was decent too. I'll still never understand why they never played the original version on TV or even put it in the Michael Jackson's Vision box set from 2010, if anyone even bought that because I still don't think the estate mastered the videos for full screen 1080p and they put all their time into making those title cards for each song. But oh wait, wasn't I supposed to stop talking my shit? Now Morphine to me is one of the darkest songs in Michael's discography. You could also say this song is the saddest, even sadder than songs like Stranger in Moscow or Childhood, because this song was a cry for help. A cry for help that unfortunately went unnoticed and unanswered. As most of us know, Michael struggled a lot of his life with an addiction to prescription drugs. And I may get flack for saying that, but to some degree, it is what it is. Michael Jackson was not perfect and he was a man that was in genuine pain, physically and emotionally. And just as human beings do, you find a way to cope. A lot of his prescription drug issues, they can be tied back to that fateful day in 1984 when his hair caught on fire filming a commercial for Pepsi. Although, I believe at this point in his life, this was more so his introduction to different pain medications and he wasn't abusing them. I feel like that didn't start until probably later in his life. Specifically when MJ did huge world tours or shows or when he was under immense amounts of stress. Specifically during the time of the allegations, the dangerous tour, the 30th anniversary special, and of course gearing up to do This Is It. Please understand y'all, I love Michael Jackson with my heart and soul and I'm not trying to make him seem like a bad person by bringing these things up. I'm more so just trying to create a picture of where MJ's headspace could have been when he was developing this song. L-O-V-E y'all. L-O-V-E. After the Pepsi incident, he suffered second-degree burns to his scalp and underwent several surgeries which left him in pain for the rest of his life. Also, in 1999, during his MJ and Friends tour while performing Earth Song, the middle section of the bridge he was on collapsed. The 
the show of course went on, but MJ did not leave that scene unscathed and suffered a sprained ankle, shocked nerves, and slight burns on his arm. This, again, was more pain that would unfortunately become chronic. As I mentioned earlier, in 1993, MJ canceled the remainder of his Dangerous World tour to check himself into rehab for an addiction to painkillers. It was at this time that the song Morphine was born. MJ really dove into this song, from of course singing the lead and backing vocals to even doing some of the percussion, drums, and guitar. Slash also did guitar for the song as well. And of course, Brad. What are they gonna do? What are they gonna do? Buxer, along with Matt Forger and Matt Carpenter, are also on the track shouting the morphine you hear in the background of the track. <laughs> to quote Joseph Vogel's book, Morphine is Jackson at his most raw, honest and experimental in both song and subject matter. The track was different than anything the artist had done before. It was songs like this that drew comparison to the industrial rock sound and dark psychological content of Nine Inch Nails. The song was also the first and only time Jackson openly addressed drug addiction in his music. I remember reading somewhere that Michael loved the song Closer by Nine Inch Nails and I don't know if that's exactly true but in some ways it's Kind of surprising. For anyone that's heard the song, it's kind of raunchy, but we already established that just as Freddie Mercury was, Michael also was a musical prostitute darling. Vogel goes on to say that at about the 1 minute and 35 mark, a knocking sound leads into an audio clip. That clip, which resurfaces and plays behind the music like a TV left on throughout the song, comes from David Lynch's classic 1981 movie, The Elephant Man. Can you come with me, too? The film about a Victorian era freak named Joseph Merrick had long been deeply important to Jackson. Y'all, I actually had someone in my life ask me if Michael Jackson really bought the elephant man's bones. And I was like, Boy, if you don't. Like, it's 2022. Can that rumor stay in the 80s where it belongs? Ugh. At about the three minute mark of the song, it slows down, and you're greeted with MJ telling you to relax in a soft tone, like an old friend leading you away from the chaos, as he starts the interlude. Relax. This won't hurt you. Before I put it in, close your eyes and count to 10. Don't cry. I won't convert you. There's no need to dismay. Close your eyes and hit the way. Dimmeron. Dimmeron. Oh, God is taking Dimmeron. As I've gotten older, it's honestly been very hard for me to listen to this song because of this interlude, knowing that he was suffering, and people in his life and certain situations just kept pushing him to the brink, leading him down this path that would eventually lead to his death, and no one cared about this warning. This portion of the song in some ways reminds me of the piano at the end of Heartbreak Hotel, also known as This Place Hotel, where you're on a wild ride and you're being taken back down. The interlude can be symbolic of the effect the Demerol would have on the user being a drug that eases away all of your pain and can provide an escape, something I know MJ desperately wanted at times throughout his life. To take a break from the darker tracks of the album, we're going to talk about an underrated gem, Superfly Sister. This song was created with the famous Brian Loren. He had worked with Michael on songs like Do the Bartman and also during the Dangerous album sessions on songs like Serious Effect, She Got It, and Work That Body, which all sound very similar to Superfly Sister. Those are all honestly some of my favorite unreleased Dangerous tracks, which is why I'm big mad punching the air, screaming, crying, and throwing up that we didn't get a Dangerous 25 album. As MJ once said about Joseph Jackson, John Branca? You can suck my dog. He had also done a song called To Satisfy You, another song from the Dangerous album Graveyard. MJ didn't want the song for himself, but sung background vocals on Loren's version for his album Music from the New World. The 
title was later changed to just satisfy you and was covered by Damien Hall, a former member of the New Jack Swing group Guy, for his solo album Straight to the Point in 1994. All of Loren's tracks for the Dangerous album felt more R&B and like the sound MJ eventually seemed to go towards with his 2001 album Invincible, whereas the Dangerous album turned out to be a New Jack Swing album with the direction of Teddy Riley. Anyway, unfortunately, Superfly Sister and many other tracks the two of them worked on together ended up not being selected for the Dangerous album. Loren had worked on about 20 songs with MJ and had given up a lot of opportunities during that time for ultimately none of his tracks to be chosen. You asked if uh, I had any regrets about spending so much time on uh, working with Michael and the answer is absolutely because I took time away from my own career because of it. Imagine I told people uh, when we started working on Dangerous, Michael asked me not to work on anything else. Mm. That's actually an oral contract. <laughs> you know, I told Michael, okay. And then proceeded to tell other record executives when they came to me that I couldn't really do anything else right now because I'm working on this Michael Jackson record. So imagine in 89, 90, I do that. Late 91 or 92, whenever Dangerous comes out, there's no Brian Lorenz songs on that record. Imagine what those record executives thought. Per the MJ cast, episode 79, the Brian Loren special, he goes on to talk about this in more depth, even saying that a lot of the fundamental elements of songs they worked on together were presented on Michael's other albums like History and Invincible, work that went on to be uncredited, which he did not blame Michael for. You know, those tracks, the tracks that we did, little bits and pieces of those tracks were used for the rest of Michael's career. So, Dangerous, History, Blood on the Dance Floor, and Invincible all have little bits of music that sound like some of those tracks. You know, I actually did write, or co-write rather, Black or White. I, I wrote the rap that's in Black or White. Michael is not responsible for why I'm not credited there, and I'll just leave that there. Yeah. You know, there was there's another party, and the other party is the one that I did the rap with because they had done it and didn't like it. I came in, I rewrote it, and I actually performed it. And then when I came in to hear it a week or so later, you know, it was their voice instead of mine. I'd highly recommend listening to the episode. A lot of tea is spilled, and you know we live for the tea on this channel, darling. So let's take a moment to give this man his flowers because he definitely put that <laughs> that Brian LaRussi in these songs. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I've gotten to a point where at first I was adding OC to everything to be annoying, but now I can't stop. Please don't unsubscribe or do. I totally understand. In regards to Superfly Sister, Loren says he brought MJ the title, the track, and the basic melody. MJ wrote all of the lyrics. I brought him the title, the track, and the basic melody for what I was calling the chorus, but he used what I was calling a chorus melody for the verse, he wanna do something freaky to you. That was, I had a chorus melody that was super fly, sister, she just do. It was like, it was the same kind of oh, pocket. Wow. Yeah, yeah. But he used that for the verse, and he also didn't use the name of the song in the title. I thought that was hot. This song to me is about, I guess, just aspects of love not being what they once were. People marrying for the wrong reasons, people having casual sex without the commitment of love or any responsibility, people getting trapped in situations maybe for the sake of just having someone to love them regardless of if it's right. I really enjoyed reading Bryce Naharo's take on the song in his book, book on the dance floor, stating that these lyrics could well be autobiographical and evoke a painful episode in the life of Michael and his family. One would not suspect it at first glance, as the dramatic significance is not as obvious as in Morphine. Still, when the star started the Dangerous album sessions, his thoughts may have been turned to his sister Latoya. Latoya Jackson was married to a man named Jack Gordon, who was physically and verbally abusive towards her. He pretty much isolated her from her family, made her say horrible things about Michael and the allegations against him to the press, and tried to overly sexualize her, forcing her to do another shoot for Playboy following her first cover shoot in 1989, and almost made her star in a pornographic film. Latoya Jackson may seem a little, uh, spacey at times, but she's been through a lot in her life, and you know what? We love and stand Legend Toya on this channel. Thank you. To keep the speculation going, I believe aspects of the lyrics could also be towards his brothers Jermaine and Randy. And to keep that story as short as humanly possible because ain't nobody got time for that. 
basically, Jermaine was messing with Randy's baby mama, married her, and had kids with her. So their kids are essentially cousins and brothers and sisters. Which is why I stand Tito, Jackie, and Marlon. You know, my unproblematic kings. I also feel like the song Monkey Business could be about this situation as well. I mean, it's no wonder MJ would be on those Danny Phantom vibes and sometimes just go ghost from the family because that right there? Messy as hell. Messy as hell. I don't understand it. Hey! I talked about the Adam Family Project and how it became Michael Jackson's Ghosts. Now let's talk about Ghosts, the song. The song was written and produced by both Michael and Teddy Riley. According to Joseph Vogel, Ghosts was developed as early as 1991. The 1991 version of the song was in the running for Dangerous until the final months. That recording, which began with an operatic prelude, had most of the key parts in place, but Jackson had it sung it all the way through. In the demo, called Ghost, he hums and improvises lyrics and sings the chorus in falsetto. Feeling it still needed quite a bit of work, Jackson held it back. Ghosts was written in 1994 during the History album sessions, but did not make the track list and the song Too Bad was put in its place. Once again, the song would resurface in 1996 and be finalized to be used in Michael's short film. This, however, was still not the final version that would be used on BOTDF in the following year. Vocal states the film cut featured a prominent synth bass, which recalled Thriller, and a funky outro. For the album version, Jackson mostly stripped out the bass, giving the track a more stark, minimalist feel. The metal crashing hook and swinging drums drive the song as haunting operatic vocals float in like mist. Jackson's vocals, meanwhile, dramatically describe the surrounding threats. Invisible ghouls, creaking floors, blood on the stairs, before giving way to the harmonies in the chorus. I feel like this song in some ways could be a callback to themes on the song This Time Around, on the History album, where he's saying, somebody's out, somebody's out to get me. They really want to fix me, hit me. Because who does they refer to? The media? The people around him? The people in his inner circle? In some ways you could say MJ always had a tinge of paranoia, as someone of his stature might. And who gave you the right to scare my family? And who gave you the right to scare my baby? She needs me. And who gave you the right to shake my family tree? They put a knife in my back, shot an arrow in me. Tell me, are you the ghost of jealousy? Someone wants to destroy him, take him down, watch him fall, and despite all of that, he keeps rising. Maybe he couldn't understand why someone would want to see him fail and chalked it up to jealousy. Also keep in mind, during this time, MJ's public image was tarnished due to the allegations, his divorce from Lisa Marie Presley, and his, well, uh, unconventional marriage to Debbie Rowe. Perhaps it could be about MJ once again in the kindest way possible, telling his haters to, como se dice, fuck off, leave him alone, and leave his family alone. Which I mean, I love to see, darling. Maybe it's about the fears and surrounding threats of being famous, especially at this time in his life as a new father to his son, Michael Jackson Jr., aka Prince. I don't know. One thing I do know is, it's a bop, but of all the songs featured in the Ghost short film, I have to say, too Bad is my favorite, personally. I also forgot to mention earlier that Ghosts, the short film, actually held the Guinness World Record for the longest music video of all time at 38 minutes until the year 2013 when Pharrell's Happy music video surpassed it. I believe he did some kind of 24-hour happy project thing. I don't really remember the logistics. I just, I really, really hate this song. <laughs> If hell is real, Tom Schneiden is down there, dressed light of course, with that song played on a never-ending loop. Now, the actual music video for Ghost was cut down to like 5 minutes, and I think Sony kind of messed around with it and MJ wasn't really happy with that, but of course this would sort of mark the downfall of Michael's relationship with Sony, leading into the Invincible album debacle. <laughs> Lastly, let's talk about the final of the bunch of new tracks from this album, Is It Scary? This song was written by Michael, Jimmy Jam, and Terry Lewis. It was first worked on during the Addams Family Values Project in 1993 along with Teddy Riley. That version was ultimately scrapped and the track was revisited during the History album sessions. MJ had the lyrics and melody worked out so Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis came in and developed what MJ already had. In an interview, Jimmy Jam said he had already worked with Teddy Riley on a track with a similar theme. He 
had asked us to write the music track for this song he had in mind, and we just created this sort of sinister track. We weren't sure if Michael was going to include the song on the album or what he wanted to do with it. Although Michael had done his lyrics, the track wasn't fully finished, so we went in later and finished the track and mix. Ghost and Is It Scary are one and the same, both beginning with that eerie, chilling feeling, and this seems like an unintentional sequel. The song feels autobiographical to what people thought about Michael Jackson during this time. Vocal states, in Is This Scary, Jackson is self-aware enough to recognize that people view him as a freak or worse. Yet he asserts that what we can see in him might reveal more about the observer than the observed. If you want to see eccentric oddities, he sings, I'll be grotesque before your eyes. He'll be grotesque, that is, because that is what a prejudiced culture sees and wants to see. It is what they've made him. Just like in childhood, it's MJ for the first time really addressing the darker sides of fame and what it has done to him and that although MJ did his best to not let the things people said about him bring him down, at times it did get to him. You should not say he's an animal. He's a, you should not say he's Jacko. I'm not a Jacko. I'm Jackson. Wacko yeah, Wacko Jacko. Jacko. Where'd that come from? Well, Some English tabloid. I have a heart and I have feelings. I feel that when you do that to me. It's not nice. Don't do it. I'm not a wacko. I haven't really ever taken the time to listen to the remixes that much, as I personally don't like remixes. And if you like the remixes on BOTDF, that's okay. I'm allowed to have an opinion. I mean, all I can say is the Scream Louder remix was decent, Too Bad was decent, and the History one was okay. So basically, anything with Tony Moran's name on it. Except for this time around, because honestly, what the fuck. However, I'd like to take the time in this section to put MJ's thoughts on the remixes out there as well, because as we know, MJ just wanted BOTDF to be an EP, and many fans consider it an EP anyway, and I don't think it would have been a bad idea for it to be an EP. Nonetheless, Michael Jackson fights hard, but Sony Music fights harder. Hmm, then again... <laughs> Now, the remixes selected for the album were of the songs Scream, Money, Too Bad, Stranger in Moscow, This Time Around, Earth Song, You Are Not Alone, and History. In a channel by the name of History in the Mix, he talks about Michael Jackson's worst remixes, and he brings up a very valid point that I have to bring up here. Now, this album was mainly supposed to be dance remixes, right? And if that's the case, who is in the club getting nasty to a dance remix of Stranger in Moscow, one of the saddest songs in MJ's discography? And whose daughter is in the club disrespecting their father to a dance remix of Earth Song? And you are not alone? It's not meant to be a fast-paced dance song. It's sensual, it's soft, it's not meant for that. Then again, Sony also thought it was okay to put Afrojack. Can't even say it, I can't even say it. <laughs> Sony also thought it was okay to put Afrojack and Pitbull on that bad remix for Bad 25. And I should honestly be entitled to some kind of compensation for having to listen to that trash. But let's not even go there. In an interview in 1998 for Black and White magazine, Michael was asked if he was satisfied with BOTDF and what he thought of the remixes, to which he says, I'm never satisfied with anything. If it was for me, no album would ever come out. The least I can say is that I don't like them. I don't like it that they come in and change my songs completely. But Sony says the kids love remixes. This was confirmed by Laurent Hopman for Bryce Nahar's book, Book on the Dance Floor, where he states, It was difficult to talk about it because we were afraid of being unpleasant, even insulting if we talked freely about what this album had inspired to us. For my part, I had found that the concept of the record, 50% unreleased, 50% remixes, didn't suit Michael's stature. The presence of those dreadful remixed versions interfered with the unreleased tracks and made the whole thing seem like a soulless product. To our surprise, Michael shared our opinion and hated half of the record he had it produced as much as we did. He talked about it with bitterness, he had been forced by Sony to accept this compromise, and it had costed him dearly. Obviously, it wasn't like him to release a record like that. The concept was hybrid, and the result was strange. So obviously, Michael didn't like the remixes at all. And didn't someone somewhere once say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it? As I said earlier, do y'all really think Michael 
I'm a perfectionist, Jackson would sin, cosign, and tangent a project where he essentially wouldn't have creative control for over half of an album with his name on it. This album, much like history since it didn't give Sony the numbers they had anticipated, would be the turning point, I fear. Sony washed their hands of MJ with this project, and during this same year, 1997, is when production on Invincible would start. And well, I, uh, I think we all know how that turned out. <laughs> I feel like so much of Michael Jackson's great music came out through the latter half of his life and went unnoticed. And let me explain this before I get dragged in the comments because I know a lot of y'all hate MJ's later years, but please put the pitchforks and torches down for a sec. It's not that off the wall, Thriller and Bad weren't good albums. They were clearly amazing. But after Bad, MJ just changed. His music became more about world issues, climate change, and on rare occasions, elements of his life he had never shared outside of the bounds of his music. But I feel like with this album and Invincible being the catalyst, it became kind of a ticking clock about how MJ could give Sony what they wanted fast enough so he could get out of his contract. Anyway, let's talk about the official release of Blood on the Dance Floor. <laughs> Blood on the Dance Floor, the album, officially released on May 20th, 1997. The title track single peaked at only number 42 on the US Billboard Hot 100, but went number one in Denmark, New Zealand, Spain, and the UK. It also cracked the top 10 in several other countries, like Australia, Finland, and Germany, to name a few. The second single, Ghosts, did not even chart in the United States, but again, did relatively well in other countries, peaking at number three in Italy, number 43 in Australia, and spending 17 to 18 weeks weeks on the charts in other countries. There was extremely limited promotion of this album in the United States. Shit, if there was any at all. A lot of people I know don't even know about Ghosts or BOTDF, so when I find someone that does, I'm instantly surprised because it must mean they're a genuine fan. I guess the United States wasn't checking for Michael at this point due to the false allegations from years prior, but this album was also meant to be promo for MJ's European leg at the history tour, so maybe that's why it specifically wasn't marketed in the United States. As for the album as a a whole. It peaked at number 24 on the US Billboard 200 and about a month after its release had sold 92,000 copies. Of course, the album did well outside of the United States, debuting at the top of the charts in the UK and selling 50,000 copies and 445,000 copies in Germany. As far as the longevity of the album, it has sold over 6 million copies worldwide and to this day is the best-selling remix album of all time. A lot of the critics hated this album, pretty much bashing its experimental sound and making it seemed like he was playing victim. Ooh, let me read a review. According to Jim Farber of the New York Daily News, the world's most powerless billionaire, it seems, mewling about forces conspiring against his heavenly self, he said of the lead single, Jackson coughs up a series of strangulated mutters and munchkin hiccups in lieu of a vocal, while its chilly Fox industrial music proves as appealing as a migraine, he continued. Ghosts and Is It Scary boast a few innovative sounds, but no real melodies. Aww, it looks like I found the sucking ghosts of jealousy in you, Jim. Of the tracks, personally, BOTDF is my favorite, then Ghost, Is It Scary, Superfly Sister, and Morphine. Although, I genuinely like all of the tracks. To say this is MJ victim blaming is a reach and um, I'm all out of Icy Hot, so I won't be going there. And I, for one, love this album because of MJ's raspy tones and hiccups and so-called strangulated mutters. It's that MJ sound that distinguishes him among everyone else. Now, as someone from the United States, this album is definitely a forgotten Michael Jackson album here. I feel like people only know Ghosts because it was in the Michael Jackson Experience game. And so was BOTDF actually, I think, on select consoles. Anyway, for countries outside of the United States, this album did really well, and this feels like a very highly regarded and remembered time for the MJ fans that were around to experience the rollouts of both this album and history. I envy you. I truly do. All in all, if we eliminated the remix tracks from the equation and this was simply released as a five-song EP per MJ's instruction, I think this project would have been more memorable because, of course, the whole album concept just felt out of character for Michael Jackson and a lot of the time we as consumers don't know what goes on behind the scenes and what artists are forced into doing at the discretion of their record labels. So many amazing ideas MJ had were never brought to light so solely because of Sony. And for the record, not all kids like remixes. And as a matter of fact, that's exactly why I skipped over this album for so long, because it was advertised as such, and when I listen to Michael Jackson, 
When I listen to a Michael Jackson album, I want Michael Jackson. Not remixes he didn't even curate, or Jason Malachi, or James Porte. Yeah, I'm looking at you, Michael album. But don't let the remixes deter you from listening to one of Michael's darkest, enigmatic, experimental works in his entire discography. Justice for the first five tracks of Blood on the Dance Floor. Thank you. If you made it to the end of the video, I appreciate you so much for watching. I truly do. I tend to lean towards making videos about, like, things people in the fandom, to my knowledge, don't really talk about. This album being one of them. BOTDF is legit one of my favorite MJ songs, like, of all time. I play it religiously. It's always in my Spotify wrap-up at the end of the year. But, as always, let's keep the conversation going, darling. What are your thoughts on Blood on the Dance Floor as a whole? Do you like the remixes or do you think Sony should have listened to MJ and just created an EP? And as always, all sources used in this video will be linked in the description, of course. And if your work was featured in this video and was not cited, please let me know as I want to make sure everything gets cited accordingly. I want to give you, the viewer, the opportunity to do your research as well. In other news, I have a lot of big plans for videos, but as I've communicated through my community posts, my computer will not let me be great and wants to implode every time I try to make a video over 30 minutes. Anyway, so I might have to start making multi-part videos or make shorter videos, make more regular content, but my personal preference is just to make longer videos because, you know, I enjoy long video essays, but let me know your thoughts. Also, let me know what kind of content you want to see from me. You know, I'm for the people. You know, I thought about making a video about the History album as well as for the Escape album. You know, I've seen a lot of comments about people wanting one for Escape. Of course, the Conspiracy series is coming, but that one will be a ways away due to the amount of research that I have to do for it. And I'm just a single person doing all of this, y'all. So bear with me. Also, again, I just want to say thank you for all of the new people who have subscribed to my channel. I appreciate all of you. I appreciate all the love y'all show for me in the comments and also on Twitter. I've gotten to talk to so many lovely MJ fans and it's made me so happy. And once I hit a thousand subs, I'd love to do like a Q&A if that's something y'all will be down for to get to know the woman behind the voice. And of course, that would actually be like a video like I'd be on camera for that, you know, if you're down, you know. But if you want updates on me and future videos, I would highly recommend following my social media accounts at underscore Hannah Savage on both Twitter and Instagram, as well as checking the community tab on my channel. I try to post updates frequently. Thank you guys for helping my channel grow. It's baffling to me how many of you guys genuinely vibe with me and what I put out. And as MJ always says, I love you more. And before you even try to say it, I love you most. And I will see you guys in my next video. Thank you.